So let me first start by telling you a little bit of the short version of the story of Caribou. We started in 2011 as a spin-off from the lab of Jennifer Doudna, um, working on CRISPR technology, and we started as a platform company. So the idea was to work with various partners to exploit the gene editing technology. So we founded Intelia and provided them with the license to use the CRISPR-Cas9 technology for uh, human therapeutics. We work with other partners in the areas of ag, in the area of animal health. And during that time, Caribou as a company, we really focused on the gene editing platform with the goal of improving the specificity. And so eventually, as I'll show you in a few slides, we came up with a second generation technology that we call Chardonnay. And with that, we really pivoted from a platform company to a therapeutics company. So we're now building a portfolio of therapies, and we do that in two areas. The first area is um, allogenic CAR T cells. Um, the second area is uh, uh, edited gut microbes. So we use gene editing to edit uh, the gut microbes. Uh, we've raised 41 and a half million so far. Uh, we still have a significant equity stake in Intelia, and we have about 60 employees. So this slide shows you the management team, um, as well as our board and our ACB. So the management team is really a blend of CRISPR experience and industry experience. Our CEO, Rachel Horowitz, came from the lab of Jennifer Doudna. She was on the board of Intelia for some time. Uh, myself, I've spent time in many uh, pharma companies. I've been at AstraZeneca, I've been at BMS. Uh, our chief scientific officer, Steve Kenner, has both biotech and pharma experience. He started his career at BMS. He's been since then at Arrowhead, at Aztecs, and many times he's taken compounds into the clinic. Similarly, our chief legal officer, Barbara McClung, has been both in larger companies and in, in multiple biotechs. Our scientific advisory board reflects the scientific focus of the company, and this is really a blend in three areas. So we have a few people like uh, Amy Bat or Emily Balskas that have experience in the microbiome area. We have people like Jennifer and Martin Yanek that bring experience in the gene editing area. And then we have a few people that have experience in the CAR-T space, uh, like Nupur Raj or Cameron Turtle. I probably don't need to explain to this audience the advantage of allogenic therapy over autologous therapy. As you can see on this slide, I've put in the data from the Zoom and One trial. The autologous therapies have generated a lot of excitement due to the amount of efficacy and to the longevity of therapy. However, there are limitations, the fact that it takes quite a while to generate the therapy for the patients, um, some manufacturing failures, the fact that you're starting with T cells from very sick patients, uh, and very significant production costs. And we hope that you know, by moving to an allogenic therapy, we can actually improve all of that by having an off-the-shelf product, by starting from uh, T cells from healthy volunteers, so we actually get uh, a much more um, consistent product, and then by having the ability to manufacture multiple batches, which give us hopefully greater efficiency and, and lower cost. So this is the pipeline of products that we're building at Caribou. As I mentioned, it's really two areas, CAR T cells and then microbiome products. Our first product, CB10, is an uh, ex vivo edited T cell that targets CD19, and we do a couple of edits. We selectively insert the CAR into the track locus, and then we knock out uh, PDCD1. Our second product, CB11, we haven't disclosed the uh, molecular target, but it's also an ex vivo edited T cell. And in this case, we do slightly more sophisticated editing. Um, we actually do a couple of knock-ins. Um, and then beyond that, CB30, we start to move into uh, other immune cells. And then uh, CB31 is our first product in the gut microbe area. So over the next few slides, I'm going to first tell you a little bit about the platform and tell you about Chardonnay, a next generation platform, and show you the improvement in specificity. And then I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about CB10, our lead product. And then finally, I'll quickly touch on our uh, microbiome efforts. I'm assuming that this group is pretty familiar with the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene editing. At the heart of it, it's the combination of two things, uh, Cas9, which is a DNA cutting enzyme, and a guide that's typically made of RNA. The two of them form a complex that will actually do a double-stranded cut of the DNA. 
That double-stranded cut can be repaired in two different fashions. The first way is through non-homologous enjoining, and that typically results into a knockout of a particular gene. The other way is to have homology-directed repair, and that typically results in a knock-in of the gene. So what we've tried to do with our next generation technology is to improve on the specificity. And in order to do that, what we've done is we've left Cas9 alone and we've worked on trying to engineer the guides. And what we find is if we create guides that are a hybrid of RNA and DNA, so they're actually guides that comprises both RNA and DNA, we can actually improve the specificity. And that's because we actually modulate the affinity of the guide uh, for the target sequence. And when, when in the machinery of the, the, the Cas9 complex, when we modulate that affinity, we can actually get greater specificity. Um, we call that next generation CRISPR hybrid RNA-DNA, or Chardonnay for short. I'll show you in a few slides the improved specificity. The other advantage of the next generation technology is that we already have issued IP on it. So the first thing I need to show you is that we haven't lost anything in terms of editing efficiency. So what you have on this slide is uh, editing efficiency of RNA guides versus Chardonnay guide across a variety of genes. So the bar in darker color is an RNA guide. The bar in lighter color is a Chardonnay guide. Each color is a different uh, gene. And then the, the pairs of bars are different low size on the gene. And what we're measuring is the editing efficiency. And basically what you can see is across a variety of genes, across a variety of low size, um, we get very similar editing efficiency with the Chardonnay compared to the all RNA guide. So clearly the question is about specificity, and this is what's shown on this slide. So again, on this slide, we're looking at a variety of genes in different colors, and when comparing side by side the all RNA guides versus the Chardonnay guide. And what you can see, for example, if we take uh, the track locus in red, so the top line compares the on-target efficiency, and as you can see, it's actually very similar between the Chardonnay and uh, the RNA guide, but when we look below at the off-target effect, in the example of TRAC, the, the all RNA guide will give us a few off-target effects, and with the Chardonnay guide, we don't see any of that. And uh, that's also happening when we look at other genes uh, that are relevant for the CAR T cells, as well as if you look in blue on the left-hand side, we actually look at AVS1, which is not a gene that we use for our therapies, but it's a gene that's well known in the gene editing field because it's quite promiscuous. And as you can see, the all RNA guide gives you quite a bit of off-target effects, whereas the Chardonnay, we don't see any. And I should mention that we, we measure the off-target effects using a, an assay that we develop in-house that's called SiteSeq. That, that's a very broad assay that has both the biochemical component, where we look in a completely unbiased fashion as to um, where off-target effects can happen, and then we look at um, some of these off-targets in two T cells. The other thing related to platform that we've been focusing on is translocation. So as soon as you do a couple of edits, you have the potential for chromosomal translocation. And Selectus has actually published on the subject, and, and, and they've mentioned that you know, typically when they do multiplex editing, they see between three and 4% translocation. And um, in our hands, um, with our, um, our Chardonnay guides, um, this is typically what we would see. So what we've done is we've actually developed internally a proprietary protocol that aims to minimize translocation. And I can't tell you more much about it because it's currently um, under pan filing. Uh, but when we use our proprietary protocol, we can really take down translocations to very, very, very small amount. Uh, in, in, in this example, we get actually 0.1% translocation. So I've described to you our platform technology um, that's pretty robust. Let me tell you a little bit about how we use it to make therapeutic products and talk to you about our first product, which is CB10. Okay, so as I mentioned, CB10 is an allogenic CAR T cell. It's an ex vivo edited product. We start with donor-derived T cells and we make a couple of edits. The first one that we do is we insert the CAR into uh, the track locus, so that's the T cell receptor alpha constant locus, so that in a single step, we knock out the TCR as well as we put in the CAR in a defined location. And then the other change that we make is we knock out PDCD1, which is the genes that encodes for PD1, and that's hopefully to give us greater persistence. 
There's a couple of literature precedents that have looked at um, knocking out or influencing PD-1 uh, to prolong uh, the efficiency of CAR T cells, and they're shown on this slide. Uh, the paper on the left is a paper from the Marsden Lab at UCSF that's actually been creating CAR T cells that knock out PD-1 and compare them with uh, CAR T cells that don't have the PD-1 knockout. And they basically show in that paper that you get greater persistence by knocking out PD-1. The example on the right is a paper from the Brechen lab um, that's looking at CAR T cells that express an SCFV to PD-1, and again, he shows that you get greater persistence. I'll show you now a bit of data on our CB10 product. This is looking at the in vitro cytotoxicity, and we're looking at two different cell types. On the left side, you have ALL cells, and we're looking at the ability of the, the, the CAR T cell to kill the tumor cells. And so what you have in red is our CB10 product, and in blue, you have a control uh, T cell that just has the, the, the track knockout. And what you can see is a very uh, uh, robust dose-dependent killing of the tumor cells that corresponds with an increase in expression of interferon gamma. And you see the same thing on the right-hand side in a DLBCL model. A little bit of in vivo data with our CAR T cells. Um, so here we're looking at a mouse model of ALL where we implant uh, NALM6 uh, tumor cells that express pdl one We let them engraft for five days, and then we treat the mice either with PBS, with control cells that have the truck knockout, but that don't have the car, or CB10. And as you can see on the slide, at uh, day 33, we get very good tumor control with our CAR T cells, um, and, and we don't get any, obviously, in, in, in the control cells. Let me just finish quickly by touching on the efforts that we have on the microbiome area. So the reason why we're interested in the microbiome is, as you guys probably know, um, the gut microbes have the ability to produce metabolites at very physiological concentration into the gut, as well as it's been shown there's a very significant uh, relationship between the gut microbes and the immune system. And so we believe for these reasons that if you can engineer gut microbes, you potentially have the ability to generate therapeutics that would be very interesting. If you look at what people have been doing in the microbiome area, they really fall into two camps. There's, there's many companies that are working to try to manipulate existing consortia of microbes. So they take the natural microbes and they try to define the particular consortia. And then you have some people who do engineering of the microbes, but typically they're limited to E. coli, which is, uh, which is a microbe for which a lot of the engineering tools have been developed. What we've been trying to do at Caribou is to develop a very broad platform so we can actually engineer any gut microbe. And that gives us the ability to, for example, take microbes that reside in a particular area of the GI tract and then engineer them so that at that particular location we can, have, we can either deliver entities or we can have a particular effect. In order to do that, we've been building a broad platform um, to give us the ability, one, to identify, isolate, and characterize various uh, microbe strains. Um, two, we've been developing capabilities to actually deliver the gene editing machinery into the microbe. And in order to do that, we've been developing a phage platform. The third thing we've been to, able to do is develop the CRISPR tools to be able to engineer the gut microbes. Now, if you're gonna use CRISPR in microbes, it's very different than if you use it in eukaryote cells. As I've shown you the mechanism in eukaryote cells, you do a double-stranded cut and that gets repaired. In the microbes, if you do a double-stranded cut with CRISPR, actually the microbe will die because they don't have the machinery to repair the cut. So what we've been able to do is develop a set of tools so that we can actually do the editing. And some of the tools we have include a nickase, so these are variants of the nuclease that actually do a single stranded cut. We use dead Cas9, which is actually a way to actually have transgenic manipulations of the genes. And we use the, the CRISPR-Cas9 system as a way to actually select bugs that have not been modified once we've done some changes. And then finally in the platform, we've been developing an in vivo animal model so that we can both track um, the, the edited microbes as well as the physiological effect. 
The idea that we have now that we have established this platform is to use it so that we, again, take a gut microbe, edit them ex vivo, and then use them as therapeutics. And we're now working on applying the platform in a couple of areas. One is immuno-oncology, trying to find ways to actually find um, uh, generate bugs that will improve uh, response to immunotherapies. Um, the other one is trying to modulate uh, metabolites uh, that can be produced by some of these gut microbes. I'm actually out of time, so I'll just very quickly say as a summary that I hope I've been able to describe to you what we're doing as a company, both the Chardonnay technology that has improved specificity, that is a robust platform. I've told you about some of the therapies we're building in the CAR-T space, as well as I've told you about some of the work that we're doing in the microbiome space. I'll be outside after the talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions there. Thank you.